Welcome to the Cup of Nurses podcast. What's up, guys? Welcome to the podcast. Today, we're going to talk about the current health news, which starts with the sperm count, guys. So a Swiss study did a um, study on 2,500 men, and it concluded that 17% of these young men were not sufficient in their like um, sperm count, their like pH, all these factors that the World Health Organization takes into consideration. So it makes it harder like, for getting fertility. pregnant. Long story short, yeah, we might not be the we might be the culprit of the infertility in women instead of women being infertile to men for like the longest, which we've been thinking. So getting back on the study, twenty five percent of men didn't reach the threshold of their motility, guys. So that guy wasn't swimming well. 25% of them, man. That's one in four. So these guys are not doing well, including, let's go down the aisle here. 20, 43% of those men in that 2,500 sample had abnormal sperm. What does that entail, abnormal sperm? Those, the five analysis that the World Health Organization does, which is motility, mm-hmm. morphology, the volume, the level, the pH. So they look different. They swam different. Different consistency. That's a lot of abnormalities, dude. Yeah. So the um, infertility, or the what is it called? The artificial insemination uh, market is rising. I think in twenty by twenty twenty five, it's projected to be two point six three million. So that's it's growing. And what is the reason? We have to ask that question. It might be men. How do you feel about that? Um, I mean, that would suck. I mean, just imagine. So I think the average for making a baby i think it's six months to a year of of trying that's a pretty long time you know so if you plan on having a kid if you want to have a kid soon and it's going to take you about six to one year to make a kid you know you got to plan ahead guys like the baby ahead. making has to start a year in advance yeah so that's, that's a lot of work i mean a lot of work to make the baby a lot of work to raise the baby but now with the sperm count it could be even longer you know, if you said, what, 45% of men suffer from this from this issue of lack of motility or pH is off balance. It just makes getting, getting pregnant a lot harder. Yeah, and they, they think the factors that are um, creating this issue is things like physical activity, exercise, the food that we take in, which we kind of preach a lot about. So, Is it the lack of physical exercise or due to physical exercise? The study didn't um, run those tests on those swishmen to understand that. But they're, they're linking it towards being like insanitary lifestyle, basically. The choices you are making is not only affecting like your you know, digestive system, is affecting your reproductive system to the point where they're, you know, analyzing these sperm cells and the issue is men. Yeah, man, that's bad. If you eat bad, you stack a lifestyle, you're really stressed, that's going to go all the way down to your balls, you know? <laughs> you know, your heart's going to be unhealthy, your Literally. liver's going to be poor, and now you can't make any kids, man. I know. That'd Wouldn't that burn you out? That would suck, man. Speaking of burnout, we're supposed to talk about nursing burnout. That's a pretty well-known topic. I feel like we talk about being stressed out at work, but are we realizing that that stress might be burnout? That's very true. Like we we talk about nursing burnout as like, yeah, I think she's burned out, but just imagine, do you, do you think you are burned out as a nurse? I felt a little bit at one point. Like it's easy to point it out, be like, yeah, man, she's tired. She's been, she's been slacking or like she's kind of been, been off the ball. And you attribute to nursing burnout, but you might, you yourself might be off the ball, or you might be pushing away from nursing burnout, saying, "Well, I had a rough day at work, I had a rough day at home, I didn't get enough sleep," and they're pushing these other things and never looking at the picture of, "Hey, your your lack of sleep might be burnout. It probably isn't you sleeping or you're not getting enough sleep." So you have to start connecting the dots, and let's let's categorize what burnout exactly means. So the exact definition of it is. Being stressed out physically, mentally, and emotionally exhausted. So stress is defined as being over-engaged at work, which is causing stress. And burnout is identified as disengagement. So think about burnout as you are so stressed out, your nervous system is so overstimulated that you literally become dull and like get fatigued. It's like getting, it's like getting um, overstimulated to caffeine where it doesn't affect you as much. And burnout is causing dull emotion in people and like a sense of detachment. So if you're, go ahead. That's really true. Like you see a lot of times people, they get detached from work 
where they you know start to show up late. Um, they just try to they start to have like a like almost a plain flat affect. Like you could sense that they dread coming to work and they don't want to be there and they don't want to talk to the patient. They don't want to be in the rooms. Do you think they're you've seen those nurses out. before? Oh yeah, definitely. You know, you, you'll probably see it more often than you than you think. And then when you really think about it and observe it. And you look at their trend on how they've been like performing or how they've been acting or um, socializing, and that's on a decrease. They're definitely either burnt out or stressed over something. And they come to work and they bring that with them. They leave to work and they take work to their house. You know, yeah. so maybe they be they might be fighting more with um, their significant other, or they have like a sense of hope where they don't want to do anything throughout the day. They skip the gym, and it's just like this cascade of events that start leading to the question of are you burnt out do you need to switch your job and it's kind of interesting because or you can switch the shift you know switch the shift take a pto day take a pto day there's like this nurse that i see on instagram and her like little initial thing was like um ex ex nurse now burnt out and like pursuing something else so she herself realized that she's burnt out and she's doing something about it, which is awesome. Yeah, I mean, the first step to not being burnt out and probably being more happy with your job is realizing that you do feel like crap. And you probably need to take a few days off, just recalibrate, stay home, just, just think, meditate, just do something to relax, do something for yourself. Take a little, a little staycation or, or like a vacation. You know, it doesn't have to be far. Have it be like, you know, an hour away or two hours away. Do something nice for yourself. Yeah. Um, one study that we found in 2014 at the University of um, Akron. So basically it studied, studied nursing in the field and said um, one of the biggest factors that might be leading to burnout is when you take your job too serious. So if you graduated nursing school and your goal was to help others and you went to school wanting to help others and you got a job because you want to help others, you're more susceptible to burnout because you take your job so seriously as success or failure. Yeah, it's fortunate over compassion and putting too much emotion into this job is going to make you suffer in the long run. You but, can't be bringing stuff home. But that's like saying the exact opposite of what, exact opposite of what we went to school for because yeah, they tell you to, compassion is number one. But what if that compassion might be causing you to have burnout? Isn't that crazy? Like they drill that into your head, compassion, compassion, compassion. Think about the patient. You know, imagine if you were in their shoes. Yeah, but like you got to be in their shoes, and then once you're in, your shift ends, you got to be in your own shoes. It's like America, where every single day we said the pledge of allegiance to you know the flag in school, and we had this sense of loving America in a way, right? Hopefully that was their intention. Here, this compassion is like this double-edged sword, yeah. where well, you we're not saying it. don't have compassion and you know don't care about your patients, but you're not going to be able to save everybody. And if you view your success as saving someone's life all the time. You definitely not think about it in the right, in like the right way. You gotta think about it as in you do your best no matter what. And if this patient happens to die, it just happens. I it's think not based on performance. Yeah, I think in the ICU it's important more than ever, like in the high acuity, because we see it so many times where patients are always dying, going hospice, like they're just not making it. I feel like in, the, I did a med search for a little bit, and med search is more of this environment of happiness not happiness i mean it's a job right but the patients are more grateful they tell you thank you sometimes you know i did a hip and ortho unit so the population was a little bit younger and coming into the icu like it's a lot more suffering and grieve and you basically have to clock out and live your life knowing you've seen all this stuff and how do you cope with it yeah it's crazy you're basically so in the icu um you it's hard it's kind of hard to get compassion back from patients understanding because they emotionally and socially cannot tell you that they're feeling good or they're getting better. Your view of them getting better or them doing good is under physical symptoms. Yeah. You know, other vital signs are stable and they're doing good. You know, you don't get to, you don't, don't know if they're actually doing good. You just based on physical symptoms. And like med surge or, or tele or those units where you can spend more time with patients, it's a lot easier to feel good because you get that social inter- interaction. I think that's what's they could, missing. They could tell you about, uh, about their day. You could tell you about, about your day. And, but in ICU, you, can't have, you don't have that. So as you, much because yeah. these people aren't talking sometimes. Yeah. I feel like ICU is more based on like stats. You, know, you feel like it's just a number, game of numbers. It is a numbers game. And you're almost obsessed with these numbers where you have to find out your patient's blood pressure. Sometimes you're doing something you're like, oh, i got to check up on the numbers. So it's, it's like a number game. It's like the addiction when people get when they count their macros and they have to be they have to eat like you know consistently these numbers it's like you're taking it in like that yeah 
Yeah, a good day and a happy patient is a patient that's within their um, butter sign limits. You know, and yeah. compared to tele and like oncology and those units where patients doing good by them telling you they're doing good. Yeah. So let's talk about the warning signs, the signs and symptoms of a nursing burnout. So the five would be irritability, frequent call-ins, change of environment, exhaustion, and just being checked out mentality. Uh, the checked out mentality. I feel like irritability is really easier to tell. If you know you're having a good day, everyone's having a good day, and the same nurse comes back the following night or far following morning, and you ask my question, and they snap for no reason. Like it's like like what happened? Like you were fine like yesterday, now you're like you know like you're like you're snapping for no reason or complaining that they got to go back in the patient's room yeah. and complain that they have an annoying patient consistently, and it's, it's like I think you could see it in the older nurses. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I That's think fine. you can see it in older nurses because you know how like they come and they have like this mood. We call this a mood, and it, they're irritated, and eventually this mood carries on because they you know work three days a week, and this mood becomes a personality, yeah. and we say. Oh, that's just, you know, that's Susie. Susie's that way, you know, she's always been like that. Maybe she's just been burnt out for a long time and her mood became her personality because that's how the neurons are firing and creating, you know. If she's been like that, that sucks. Right, a mood becomes eventually like a personality trait. Like, that's crazy. Like, it's just like anger could be a one-time thing and then the mood continues. You don't know how to cope with anger and it becomes... And anger, you have anger, you have temper issues, right. and that becomes your personality. That's crazy. Yeah. So they go into that state of mind continuously every day, day in, day out, that that becomes their new new normal. So they think that's how we're supposed to be. They think that's how their life's supposed to go, but it's really not how it is. They're just burnt out and miserable. And you should ask a nurse if you see that within them, ask them. Help them adjust their perspective to maybe they're overstressed on they have to change their environment. Yeah. Yeah, the second one's uh, frequent frequently calling off. Um, I haven't really seen that too often. There are some nurses that like call off once in a while but just to call off. But I've never seen anybody frequently call off like week in, week out. I think it maybe it's more like you're using up your PDO because you need, to, you need to be away from work instead of taking your PDO days and doing some self-care for yourself. So maybe their freaking call is just like, oh my God, I need some PDO, I need a day off. Like they're just, they're looking forward to their PDO and that's what they're doing. Oh, true. Yeah, it's like, and that's not calling off, but... They're just using a PDO right away just because yeah. they dread coming into work. And they'll take every day off that they can. And the next one would be um, intolerance to change. So basically for dealing with difficult um, situations with like professional etiquette and let's just say you don't like the way the doctor does one thing and he continues to do it this way, you're taking care of his patients but you still know it's like a bad way to do things. Eventually that could mess with you emotionally and it could lead to burnout because... You're constantly stressed out by like the way things are happening. Yeah. So with the whole change thing, I think um, another sign um, of burnout would be with the related to the intolerance of change. I think if a nurse likes getting the same patients back over and over and over again, because that's what they just want to do and just get it over with, compared to taking like like different patients, different variations, because um, they just want to go in, they do the same thing that they do every day. The same way because they get the same type of patient back. Always cardiac patients. Always, you know, people with, with AKI, you know, and she's just going through the motions. And I think that's, that's burnout too because you don't want to do anything different. So you think consistently in the work environment as nurses could lead to burnout? Yeah, oh, definitely. So they're almost, they're almost doing this job because it becomes more autonomous for them. Exactly. So they don't, have to, they don't have to think as much and it's almost like driving a car. And yeah. sometimes you drive a car and you blank out. And the reason why you're blanking out is because you do it so often. So you think those nurses are just numbing themselves and they don't have to be so present in what they're doing. Exactly, yeah. That's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty a good perspective, good perspective right? there. Mm-hmm. Think about it. Man. Write that down, guys. If you have Pass that nurse that just, twice to see it. Yeah, if you have a nurse that, that just always see doing the same thing over and over again, nothing different. I think, I think I'm right. So that's that's, pretty, that's that pretty good there. Anyways, another one is um, exha- exhaustion. Sorry. So if you're feeling constantly exhausted, even off your off days, and I can say it myself that I've had that working three in a row being tired the next day and it's my day off but yet I don't feel like doing as much yeah you no know, it's really exhausting when you start a new job or even when we started working here in California um, the, f- the what, first week when we're on the unit yeah what what threw me off was the orientation from from 8 30 in the morning till 4 yeah so we work nights for those that don't know yeah back in Chicago we work nights three twelves from 7 to 7 and then 
like four days later, we switched our circadian rhythm to do 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then that's for five days. And the following week, we went back to night from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. in our shifts. But that completely threw me off and I was just exhausted the first week of orientation and the first week of actually working. Yeah, every single day I, w- I would wake up and I would get six to seven hours of sleep. And just like you said, a couple hours later in the day, I'm like, wow, I could really use a nap for no reason. I got enough sleep. Yeah. It just like a, a, it was mentally and physically drained. But I, feel like, yeah, but I feel like there's a lot of good, like your body is able to realize that this change can occur in the future. And I feel like um, you, th- you adapt better to it. You do something else like that again. That is true. And the next one would be um, checked out mentality where you become disengaged and emotionally like, I'm done. And you described that very well with those nurses that are just going through the motion. Yeah. Another nurse, uh, I'm trying to think, how else would you be checked out mentally? Checked out mentally where, um, let's say you're getting a lot of new orders, um, more than you used to or different kinds, and you're just kind of ordering them without actually thinking about why, this, why it's being ordered or the rationale behind your order. Like, it's like, it doesn't seem like a big deal. But I feel like that's like a, kind of like a start where we're just like events. I don't yeah we're just like I don't care what this order does I'm just gonna or I don't know what this lab does I'm just gonna do it because I just want it done in the morning, but you don't know like what it's for. So you stop questioning things, yeah. and that's where the beauty comes in nursing because you're the patient advocate, and you're able to stand firm to, hey I don't think this doctor's doing it right I'm gonna contest it. And yeah. sometimes you're just going through the motions because you're just like well whatever yeah you're just that, whatever. that's a burnout. Yep, that's very that's actually a really good point. Yeah, check that being checked out with a patient. That's, that's a little unfair, but I mean, it's how burnout works. It affects everybody. And in the, even in the ICU working, you know that third night, you feel, I can say that you, you sometimes have that mentality of just being checked out. Like, let, let me just go in, get this over with, and just go home in a way. Sometimes you feel that way. Like, when I'm working, yes, I'm, you know, very in, engaged and compassionate thinking about things, but you do get burnt out. And that's... That's where, like, that third night you get, like, the Laffies. So for you guys that don't know, the Laffies are, like, that 3 a.m., 4 a.m. feeling of just laughing for the dumbest things because you're just ready to head home. Yeah, I feel like... I don't know if that's really... I don't know if I would consider that burnout because I do feel that sometimes. It's like it's, like a, it's like a heightened mood. It's yeah. like I have a little dopamine feeling. Oh, the Laffies definitely. The Laffies definitely. Laffies hit me at, like, at like, 5 and some. You come in a patient's room and you doing some, some dumb or something stupid or he's positioned all weird, you get a good laugh out of it. You know, it sucks, you know, or they're in your strength and somehow they're like upside down, you know. And, you you and, have to laugh about it. Yeah. We, we consider that as dark humor, but I don't think it's dark humor. It's just you need an emotional outlet to like the negativity that sometimes yeah. you're seeing in the hospital setting. I completely agree because think about it. If you see a patient like, you know, like, like weird, like laying all weird on, on the bed, you can take it two ways. You can laugh at it and be like, be happy, just be like whatever and deal with it. Or you could be angry and just rest of that shift goes. Yeah, goes because down. every single time the patient, and sometimes let's just say you, the example of the restraints and he's like this laying, well, this guy is going to do it probably 20 times that yeah. shift. And it's either you can laugh about it or you go in there negatively, oh my God, John Smith did this again. Like, what the heck, John Smith? Like, get your act right. together. And it's you're going to be repeatedly exposed to negativity. And yeah. Yeah, so you're teaching yourself how to adapt to change negatively. Because every time your patient changes and you get mad about it or angry, oh, there's a loud car. It's a real loud car in the background. Wow. Whatever. Yeah, so <laughs> that's funny. What I was saying is you associate change with negativity. So every time you have a change in patient status, you're going to take it negatively instead of, pos- t- pos- instead of like positively. So the first time you go in, the patient's position all weird. You laugh it off, you know, no big deal. You do what you got to do and walk out. And then 10 minutes later, um, his blood pressure drops. You take that change as good too, like, oh, his, his blood pressure dropped. But since you're already already in a good mood because you joked off what happened to him last time, now you're in a better spirit and you're, you actually want to do the next thing. What about an example of, and I've had this before, mm-hmm. where two nights in a row, you get the, let's just say, this two same, the two same patients two, or same assignments or just a really bad patient and you're doing everything you can and it goes south. For example, like I had this like really young guy, man, um, he just came in for like some abdominal issue. Just got wheeled in, dude. Blue looking, got intubated. Like he came to us and we had like no notes, no report of what's going on. We're like, who the heck is this man? And you're just trying to save this man's life. And then like his wife comes in and they have kids at home, like t- two kids at home that are like seven and eight. 
and she tells you, please do whatever you can to save my husband. And like that, you take that to heart. You're like, wow, man, I better be doing everything. And like, see, I got chills because I take that to heart. And then I'm doing everything I can in that night to make this guy stay alive. Everything, orders, calling, stressed out. I'm calling a rapid because he's having a seizure or whatever. Blood pressure is dropping. I'm getting meds. I'm calling pharmacy. I'm doing everything. And then let's just say you're like six, eight hours in your shift and this guy codes. And that, let's just say that ex- that night, you're running a code for 30 minutes and then you just, you tell the wife, like, listen, we're doing everything we can and there's nothing else we could do to your husband. I'm sorry. And she says, okay. And then it's like that. It's very discouraging, man. That's intense. That like moments that just like, it's like the silent night, man. It's like the reaper just came in and just took somebody. Yeah. And it's, and that, you know, then they're crying and all this is going on and it's emotionally exhausting. Oh yeah. Cause you literally did everything you can and it did not work out. And and doing it for two nights, I get burnt out, man. Like yeah. that, that young guy, because of his like, you know, kids at home and what his wife told me, I was, I was working on that man. Like he was a one-to-one for like the longest. And like everything you did and your efforts go to shit. You're just like, wow. Yeah. Like damn. It sucks coming home and taking a shower and you're just like. What if I do this instead of this? I try, yeah. I personally try not to say it. I've learned, which we'll talk about the tips, but yeah, you did everything and that's it. So let's talk about why nurses burn out. (laughs) These are one of the reasons. Yeah, I know. But the reasons why nurses burn out is basically long shifts, high stress environment, sickness, and death, coping with those things. We kind of talked a lot about that, but let's go into like a little bit depth. So according to research, long, longer shifts have been um, correlated with increased med errors and also a lot of stress. We could argue that because in California here, we're doing um, eights and back in Chicago, we did 12 hour shifts. And personally, we could both agree that 12 hours are better. Uh, yeah, just because I like working three days, three times a week instead of four. Yeah. So we lock our four days off and I'd rather just be there and have the extra four hours and just kind of like be away from work more. So personally, I don't think the longer hours are creating stress in my life. I like prefer my days off. Yeah, it's very true. With the whole thing that you said about longer shifts, increased med hours and um, like those kind of um, issues. I feel like when I'm comparing that to eight hour shift, like there is, like I feel rushed in an eight hour shift. Like I feel like I, I, I gotta do so much within those, wise. In those eight hours, you know. But then with the 12-hour shift, like, you kind of have a, a really busy start, a little bit of leeway in, in between, and then a really busy morning. Yeah. You know, so, but you, the downfall of that is you're not really rushed as much as in an eight-hour shift, but you do get more tired working those 12 hours than you do the eight. But there's always buts. And this but is, well, the counter argument is we, haven't ta- we don't take lunches in Chicago. I swear because of the unions, we haven't. We don't take a full thirty-minute lunch away from the unit or the breaks. But we can. We just choose not to. I think it has to be worked better. I don't. I don't know how other hospitals are, but we didn't utilize breaks properly. And being in California, like there's a relief nurse that comes in and they take you away from the unit for thirty minutes, where you're just not thinking about what's going on because you know that nurse has it covered, and the two fifty-minute breaks. If yeah, you had something good here. If you had that, yeah, California has it very good. If we had that back home, do you think your 12-hour shift, shift would be definitely less stressful? Oh, yeah. It would definitely be a lot better if I had a relief nurse come in and leave me for half an hour and just take over. That'd be so convenient. Especially the way they do in our hospital, the relief nurse goes straight business. Like, she, like where you leave off, she picks up no matter what. Hang it, whatever she has to hang, put in order, whatever she has, she has to order. Straight business. Definitely. I agree the way that this healthcare system nails it on a dot. Yeah, we've only been to one hospital, though, but I think that's this is going to show a good example of how the rest of California, Northern California healthcare is. Yeah, and then on top of that, these 12-hour shifts, when I'm, I'm losing my train of thought here, what, what I wanted to say about the 12 hours. That you like them. You like them a lot. I do like my 12-hour shifts. But I feel like if we had the half an hour, that's what I wanted to say. Like, all these research studies are coming out, and they're pointing towards longer shifts, but we're not really considering what's happening in those 12 hour shifts how are we like you know like having that positive outlet of leaving the unit taking a smoke break whatever you guys do like that's not being talked about 
So I definitely, I definitely feel like nurses have to kind of stand up more for themselves and do something and communicate this better or bring this to awareness that our breaks and our lunches have to be done. Yes. I, yeah. That's, I mean, that's huge, man. I, I've realized it now that I'm here. Yeah, if we'll make it, we'll make a 12 hour shift go by so much better. Yeah. But maybe you can talk to managers about that. We'll see. The number two burnout is um, putting your, putting others first. So as nurses, we're this whole compassionate field and we're no- notoriously known for being selfless. And that's great. But we're also neglecting ourselves. And yeah, like we said, one thing is those, sh- you know, no, no, not yeah. taking breaks. <laughs> no, like, like we said before that um, with this whole putting others first, you you got to put them first, but you got to put them first in your shift. You can't put them first in your life. You can't be completely thinking about all the stuff you did for, for the patient after you get off shift. If you come home in a shower, you're thinking about how your patient was last night, and then you wake up again, you're, always, you're thinking about it again. You eat food, you're thinking about it. It's, it's too much. It's going to drive you crazy, man. Guilty. I can't, I can't. I mean, I'm pretty good at that. I don't do that very much. I just, I find out what happened with the patient the next time I get in there. I don't text anybody, hey, how's he doing? I, I'm just, whatever happened with him, happened with him. I'll just take off when I get in. Well, you can't do that first of all. It's a HIPAA violation, guys. But mouth is sealed. Hey. I don't do that as often, but I do sometimes go home and I'm like, dang it. I forgot to tell this nurse about this thing or I forgot to tell the nurse where this was. Like, there's little things that you leave off in a report. But healthcare is a 24-hour job. So whatever we miss, we're humans. You just got to fill up. Yeah. I mean, it's a very busy and high-stress environment. Life and death can occur on a daily basis. That and intense. I feel like there's so much uh, changing, like especially like technology, for example. It's busy. It's more busy. Like when I talked to like the, the veterans of nursing, it was a lot easier when there was no char- documentation, with, you know, electronical documentation. Back in the day, it was a little bit more simple. You chart by exception in a way. And now with like all this insurance stuff and like people are getting sued for who knows what. Documentation is so crazy. I think a lot of patients don't realize how much documentations we do. Like yeah, I hate it, man. I think like 25% of my care sometimes is with the patient, and I just got to sit down by the computer and chart it and do everything else in between. Like it's It takes up so much of our time. Yeah, documenting takes forever. You could literally pinpoint <laughs> the minute and the hour of when I changed the dressing, of when I did an assessment, when I did anything, when the blood pressure went off, when his pulse ox came off you, you know, can do it to the minute and it's when a leaf fell off and it, it it just tracks everything you do and you gotta really chart on everything it's it's the, i mean it's good in some this cases is our, yeah. this is our expectation and sometimes we have to realize the patient is priority i'll do the charting later yeah it's i mean it's good for like legal matters but it's such a pain like we over chart about everything but every time somebody sues gets bad care you know hey we gotta now add that to the system so make sure that it doesn't happen you know, people are thirsty out there. Yeah. So the high stressful environment comes from not taking breaks, charting a lot. And then let's just talk about short staffing because short staffing is another culprit there where it happens a lot. I feel like. Yeah. I'm everywhere I go. Um, every manager I talk to, they say staffing is always going to be an issue everywhere you go. Why is that? There's so many nurses that are needed to fill everything and to make everything go smoothly. It's just too hard. That includes like with the costs people's like daily life like if they can make us work 24 hours or if they can make us work 20 hours 20 hour shift they would we're just in dead demand like we're traveling over here just just to work as nurses where we had a nursing job back at home that does make sense that's how that's how easy it is to, to find a nursing job somewhere you just go and you just find it also you have to overcome with fear because if you're fearful you're not going to make the leap right that's but we true. made the leap and then the next one is um, coping with like sickness and death and I think it's like a mentality thing. You def, you you have to learn how to cope with things and create that outlet of just, this is everything I could have done. Yeah, if you cope well at work, you're going to cope well mostly outside of work. Cause Unless you're losing bad coping techniques like drugs and stuff. Don't do that. Yeah, because nursing is an emotional job in a way too, just as physical. And, th- and that emotional baggage is going to affect your outside life outside of work if you're not coping with it properly. So... That'll lead us into like the tips for burnouts, which the, so the four tips for burning out prevention would be resilience, self-care, recognizing the triggers, and then creating like strong working relationships at work. 
The first one is resilience. And if we look at the definition of resilience, it means term means the, capac- the capacity to recover quickly from difficulty and toughness. Yeah, we touched on that in the beginning of the podcast, but resilience is, is awesome. If you have very good resilience, you're going to go watch a day with like minimal scar tissue. Yeah. Related to, to nursing. Because if you could take something bad and turn it into a positive or see it as a benefit for you, that's going to make life so much better. We just have to understand that we see what we see and we, we can't look for the answers of why things happen. We just have to let that go. That's not for us to understand. Do the, much, the, do the most we could do. Be compassionate. Be you know, trustworthy. Do your best job. And then go home and just pat yourself on the back that you did everything and that's all you could have done. Yeah, like what's Matt's story with the patient that they literally did everything they could for that patient and the family and he still ended up you know, coding and passing away. Like you can't take that as, as a loss. That is no way a loss. That, that's always a win because you learned so much from that experience and you were able to bond and build a family. Yeah. Yeah, that's all positive you got from that, but you can't see it as negative just because the patient died. People are gonna die no matter what you do. I'm not gonna lie, I felt negatively in that moment, but I learned how to just kinda overcome that, you know? Yeah, it, it, seem, it took me a couple hours, so I'm not gonna lie. That yeah. kinda really hit home. You seem fairly, fairly resilient then. I mean, I'm sure you think about it once in a while, which is completely normal. You could think of your, your past action or past situations. But if you're constantly dwelling on it and unable to figure, forgive yourself for it, nah. Can't do that. Yeah, so just be resilient to it. Number I think two. We'll, sorry, it's, it's going to go with number two. So I feel like what we'll builds resilience is what we're going to talk about next is self care. Um, knowing what makes you happy and what stresses you out is going to kind of guide how you move about your day. Because if you know, let's see, let's say, I don't know, I'm not really have an example for it right now. For self care? Yeah. It just, whatever you do that makes you kind of happy and brings meaning to your life for me. That's my self care. Like, Oh, sorry. I do I, things. I di- yeah, I do. Go so, ahead. So, you know, if you have a bad day at work, instead of going home and being angry, you know, you go to the gym after a shift and just work out, work out that anger instead of bringing it home or bringing that stress home and bringing that thought of what you did yesterday and what, what made you so angry. And that's a big part of self-care. And I, and I do those things for, for me. It, I like exercising for sure. And just for the physical aspects, you know, being in shape. I like juicing. I'm sure people know that, you know, like follow me kind of more intensely as friendship, as friends. I juice like five days a week. Like that's my thing. I wake up, I feel good. I don't care about the washing part. And some people are like, oh, it takes you forever to wash. I don't care. I like it. I do it. I feel great. I yeah, try. like literally 80% of our fridge, if you're looking right now, is literally all foods for juicing. And some Swiss chard. I never had those, but I'm yeah. going to juice it. We did get some pie yesterday, though. But I had to tell them. Truth is, yeah, we had some pie. It was, it was, was delicious yeah. with some fair life milk. Yeah, that's all part of self care, guys. You have a little pie once in a while. <laughs> I agree. I felt a lot better that day with that pie. Then meditation. I like to do that. I wish I could do it more here. I probably will do that tonight. Even reading a book. I think it's like an. It's not an escape. It's it's soothing, yeah. especially reading what you like. Yeah, um, we actually did a trail today, um, or actually it's gonna be last week because this podcast comes out next week. Yeah. Um, but that's a good way to, you know, to promote self-care, especially if you live in this area of Oakland, you know, if you're, if you're a nurse and you do 12 hours or you work five eights, you know, you got nice trails over here, like utilize them. If you have, if you have, if you live in Oakland or in this San Francisco area or Northern California and you haven't walked a trail in let's say more than a year, you should definitely hit two. You should. I think it's an awesome part of self-care to learn how to just bond with nature, just bond. Nature is still and just perfect in itself. So yeah. the f- third one would be to recognize your triggers. What's causing you to be burnt out um, in your nursing job? And one, one example could be, for example, like your patient assignment, if you ever consider that. So like if you have like a neat, you know, an alcoholic patient, ETOH, that's just giving you a hard time, like you're constantly telling him to stay in bed and he's mentally exhausting all day. It is your right to say to the, to the charge nurse for next shift, if you're scheduled, I don't want that patient back. Just say it because you deserve to take a break from him because they should understand that he's mentally exhausting to you. Yeah, if you recognize that over the whole shift, you hate walking into the, to the room and every time you stepped in that room, even if you're happy, your emotion turned negative. Like, let say you were happy outside the room and as soon as you stepped in there, you're like, you were angry and upset that you had to walk in this room. Don't take that patient back. 
it's going to make you upset each time you work with them, and it's going to not be as much benefit for the patient as you to take a nurse that could care less, you know? Yeah, and, and that sometimes becomes difficult when you have, like, a bunch of, like, pregnant women on your unit where they're not going to want to take each patient because what if, like, the, you know, the guy hits the freaking girl in the womb or, you know, womb, belly, whatever. Yeah. So it's... Uterus? <laughs> the uterus, we yeah. Pitch, we got to brush it up on our female anatomy. Yeah. And so there's aspects that this may not happen, but you should ask for it. Yeah. And the other one, fourth one, would be to, like, create strong relationships within, like, your coworkers. That could be anything like getting some breakfast beers and just in general, just kind of like bonding on a unit or just having some similarities because I can 100% like um, can, I'm losing my train of thought here. Just build relationships, you know, converse, build, yeah. socialize, you know, uh, the more you socialize, the better understanding you have for your coworkers and each other. And a good example of this would be if you have like a, like, you know, like four of you are friends or five Maybe one of you likes putting in IVs, but one of them, one of you hates doing dressings. So maybe, hey, I'll put in your IV in for you to do this dressing real quick. All right, cool. I'll do it. You know, even though it's not your patient, you just do it just because you're combining your total work and you're just doing what you got to do. Th- that and, like, eventually create these bonds with your coworkers where you come into work and you kind of smile a little bit. You're kind of happy. You're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be working with this person today. And... You already start off your day in it. You start off your shift in a good way. You're just like, sometimes I'm just like, oh, it's going to be a good night because of this person. Or you're just like, every single time I work with you, something bad goes. So you just kind of like mess around and it kind of just makes your shift go by easier sometimes. Yeah, you literally make work friends. Like you have friends in your social circle outside of work and then you develop work friends where you just do stuff at work. Yeah. You know, you don't really see each other outside of work too much because that's, that's just different. Your private life. Well, you could but, you, you could have those friends yeah. at work, and they encourage hospitals encourage you to have a best friend. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty cool and stuff, you know. But a lot of times you're gonna have the most friends at work, and as long as you learn how to socialize and be friends and bond with each other and just get stuff done, that's gonna be so much better, and it's pretty fun too. Yeah. So those are the four tips, guys. Um, burnout is something we should all consider as a problem in healthcare, especially for nurses. And as nurses, we should learn how to properly see the triggers that it might be affecting it to cope with it and if your coworker is feeling you know like numb fatigued all the time and just like a lack of them as a personality at work st- say something because that person is burnt out and yeah. say something to higher management so something gets done for you guys because you guys deserve it because you we as nurses do so much so it's completely okay to take a few pto days don't take them every week and every time and don't use them up as soon as you get them. Just take a few days off if you have to. It's really not that big, not that big of a deal. Make a staycation, travel an hour away, do something for yourself. Exactly. And whoever just listened, give us a rating, give us a thumbs up, give us a like and subscribe, guys. See you guys next week. Have a good one, Oakland. Later. Keep it smooth. <laughs>